Good morning. Over the last few days, no doubt, as it's become more of a, an unfortunate custom here in Australia, we have seen the cobwebs and the pumpkins and the skeletal demonstrations in various houses and other such things as the modern, rather trite, uh, silly and quite frankly stupid American custom of the current day, uh, that of Halloween has started to, through no mere or greater factor than influence, started to permeate its way across the oceans uh, to our humble shores. Uh, a celebration which is, as I did say, trite, one which is so filled with commercialism, one which is really an activity for, at its best, inverted commas, children to have fun, and its worst for adults to rampage around in all manners of hedonism and immorality. Part of the basis and reason why this custom or this practice has now started to become a bit more popular in Australia, unfortunately, is because, in fact, the very same way in which it has become popular in its modern concept in America, and that is by virtue of the fact that this holiday, this festival of Halloween, as it's known in English, used to historically be a Christian one. It coming from the term All Hallows' Eve, like we say in the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be thy name, right? Hallowed meaning holy, or with reference to holiness and sacredness. This Christian celebration, which has been around in the church for thousands of years, has really only recently been dropped or otherwise allowed to be permeated by such commercial and wicked and sinful influences. In this case, why am I bringing this up? Because of the popularity of it now in Australia in this increasing sense, it is perhaps wise for us to remember what this actual day was and rather the biblical basis for it. Most people are often surprised to learn of the very distinctly Christian and biblical origins of the celebration of what gets commonly called All Hallows Day or All Saints Day, and I'll explain what that means in just a moment. But the primary basis for it comes from the very earliest days of the church, in fact, as far back as the second century, not long, or but a few decades after the time of the apostles themselves. And the primary basis, among many other parts of the scriptures, is this very text that we've actually just had read to us from Hebrews chapters 11, the end of 11, and the beginning of chapter 12, a passage which I know some of you are, are quite familiar with. This particular portion of the book of Hebrews actually stands as a very prominent one, not only in the book of Hebrews, but also in the New Testament for what it reaches to its crescendo of this beginning, these opening two verses here in chapter 12, where we get this famous reference to a cloud of witnesses and this call, this exhortation on the part of the author of the book of Hebrews to run the race with endurance that is set before us. And so what we'd like to do today is examine what this text says. We're going to be primarily focusing on that beginning of chapter 12, so the first and second verse respectively. We will examine the elementary or the basic elements of the ending of chapter 11. Really, if you were to do this kind of passage uh, justice from verse 32 of chapter 11 all the way through to the beginning of chapter 12, you would probably take about at least three or four weeks to do it. There, especially in the tail end of chapter 11, there is quite a lot to actually unpack, seeing as indeed the author himself actually makes the point that I'm making here. I would uh, fail for time if I were to uh, explore and expound the full depth and the great profundity of all of these uh, biblical heroes throughout the canon of Scripture. So what we're wanting to do today is look at the pretext, the basic foundational elements from chapter 11, the end there, and then reach the summit of our time this morning in chapter 12, the beginning of it, and understand why this passage has held such great significance for Christians for 2,000 years now, and why and how, rather, this has impacted their view of life and death itself. So, we'll also later on toward the end be referencing that passage that we had read to us that the liturgy from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So it might be handy uh, as we're turning to Hebrews, if you can first just kind of put a finger or a bookmark in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we'll be referencing verses 53 to 58 uh, a bit later on. Okay, so first off though, let us dive into Hebrews chapter 11. Beginning in verse 32, to 35a, so the first half of 35, we read the following. And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I recount 
Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, as well as David and Samuel and the prophets. Here the author of Hebrews is, of course, summarizing. He makes that very clear by that uh, operative phrase, uh, time would fail me if I were to recount all the various uh, figures who are referred to in the history of the church as either the cloud of witnesses or otherwise as the hall of heroes. Who, verse 33, through faith conquered kingdoms, performed righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong from weakness, became mighty in war and put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. This first portion of, of this subsection here, what is the author of the Hebrews to the Hebrews doing? He is recounting those who were victorious over their circumstance, those who triumphed, those who conquered in the face of great hardship, great trial, great tribulation, and great adversity. He references a couple of those figures, of course, many of which you'll be familiar with, Gideon and Barak and Samson from the days of the prophets and I say the days of the judges, Jephthah as well as David and Samuel and many of the prophets who did these great and mighty things that we have the privilege to be able to hold in our hand this very day and read of. These great heroes of the faith who did these wondrous things through that very faith as the author says in verses 33, 34 and the first half of verse 35. It's no small thing that he is pointing to not only the people, but also what they did, what they accomplished. By faith in God, by faith in Christ, they conquered kingdoms. They performed righteousness. They did righteous acts, right? They executed justice. They obtained promises. They shut the mouths of lions, vis-a-vis -vis David, Samson, uh, and the prophet Daniel particularly. They quenched the power of fire. All these wondrous things that we have recounted for us, these are the great triumphs that the author here is pointing us to remember and to see, and not only remember and see, but in fact actually be inspired by. There's a reason why here, as he builds to this crescendo at the beginning of what is for us chapter 12, that he is listing in a summarized, uh, condensed form the great achievements of our predecessors and ancestors in the faith. Much as the Apostle Paul himself said, imitate me as I imitate Christ, to those whom he was a, a kind of spiritual earthly father to, we too can look to these great heroes of the scriptures and draw inspiration from them. That as they imitated God, as they sought after him, as they through faith did all these wondrous and great things, we too, being joined in the very same faith by the one and the same Spirit of God, can too also triumph in the face of these kinds of things. That we too, through faith, can do great and wondrous things at small levels, at great levels, by the power and the grace of God, who, like he in they, is also in us. This summarized list is designed, not only in terms of the names, but also the achievements, to inspire us. It is designed for us to look into the past in order that we might build the future, in order that we might see the path forward being illuminated by those who have trod the path before us. Those who were victorious over their circumstances is what is in view here in verses 32, 33, 34, and the beginning of 35. As I said in the introduction, if we were to go through this in its entirety and all the way kind of peeling back the layers of this passage, we would be at least about four weeks to do it justice. We want it just wanting to get the basic fundamental elements, the pretext, in order that we can then look more specifically at the beginning of chapter 12. Halfway through verse 35, he now transitions into a parallel but distinctly and tangibly related category. This first half has been about those who were victorious over their circumstances. Now he turns to those who were victorious through 
their circumstances. And what do we mean by that? Well, let's take a look, picking up halfway through verse 35. And others were tortured, not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and floggings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, a reference to the prophet Isaiah. They were tempted, they were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins, in goatskins, being destitute, afflicted and mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in desolate places and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. He's not putting these heroes in a lesser category, in a kind of second class category, rather in a parallel one of equal virtue and of equal honour. There are those who conquered kingdoms. There are those who died in the face of conquest at the hands of foreign kingdoms. There are those who indeed shut the mouths of lions and then there were those who were devoured by the mouths of lions. There are those who triumphed, who were victorious over their circumstances, great conquerors in the faith. And then there were those who triumphed through their death. A phrase that will, and a concept that will become very important to us by the time we get into the verse one of the next chapter. These ones who triumphed through death are held in equal regard to those who triumphed over death in the face of it and were victorious in life. In this context of verse 35b all the way through to the end of verse 38, these are those who endured with patience, with courage, with virtue, with honour, the sufferings that had been laid out in the path of life before them. This alone is simply is a description of those in, obviously this book being written in the first century, those who had come in what we now call the Old Testament. It's something that's so vitally important for us to see, especially as we now build up to this beginning of chapter 12, is that both of these categories, those who were victorious over their circumstance and those who were victorious through their circumstance, are both categories that in no way, shape or form have changed in this era of the New Covenant. In fact, if anything, those numbers have increased orders of magnitude. And the great triumphs not only equal, but in some cases even surpass the greatness and magnanimity of that which we read even in the stories of the scriptures. So having completed now this particular subsection of the Hall of the Heroes, right, this explanation of the who, a summarized list, and those who have triumphed over and those who have triumphed through, we now want to jump into those first two verses of Hebrews chapter 12. The ending there, verse 39 and 40 of the previous chapter, again would be one of those parts where we would take at least one or two weeks to preach on those two verses. So to jump forward now, we've got this climax, we've got this apex of this particular portion of scripture here in verses 1 and 2 of the beginning of Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, upon the basis that he's just expounded and explored with them. Since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every weight of sin, so every weight and the sin, and the sin which so easily entangles us, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. We are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, nephos matiron, a great cloud, or a cloud singular, of martyron, witnesses. Now, why am I introducing the Greek here? Many of you will be familiar with the word in English. You may not recognize what I'm saying there in the Greek. To help us bridge that gap, martyron, or from its root, martyrios, or martus, is where we get the English word martyr. M-A-R-T-Y-R, a martyr. Someone who is put to death for their Christian faith, okay? Many ways in which these, this has occurred throughout the history of the church, but this is actually the root of this term witness. The, the root term martyrios or matus means to bear witness or to testify. 
In this essence, again, it was a relatively common Greek word, but now was applied in an ecclesiast ecclesiastical context, in a church context, wherein the one who bore witness, like, of course, the one who is referred to as the proto-martyr, the first martyr of the church, the deacon Stephen in the book of Acts, which those who were in our previous Bible study will remember, he testified, he bore witness to the true faith of God. He testified and had this incredible, courageous speech in the face of his murderers, in the face of this pack of ravenous wolves, as it were, who were surrounding him and seeking to put him to death. He testified courageously and faithfully to who the Christ was, that he was indeed Jesus of Nazareth, that he was born of the Virgin Mary, that he was crucified, that he died, that he was buried, and that he was raised from the dead for all to see, and that he ascended into the heavens and is enthroned in universal majesty, as the author of Hebrews here actually goes on to specifically state. He bore witness. He testified. And we have that historical account in the book of Acts, in those early chapters, of the first martyr of the New Covenant. The New Testament itself contains both the last martyr of the Old Covenant, John the Baptist, and the first martyr of the New Covenant, the Deacon Stephen. This transitional period, this proverbial twilight zone between the end of the Old Covenant and the beginning of the New, is bookended, really, and bridged by two most significant deaths the martyrdom of John the Baptist, the last and the greatest of prophets, and the death of the first Christian, of the new covenant, Stephen. It's for this reason that there's a very popular and famous phrase in Christianity which goes all the way back to the second century. A variety of early church fathers would routinely quote it, and that is that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. It is the seed, it is that which it grows from. Others, including myself, have also used this reference that is picked up from the Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians where he describes the church as a temple, a heavenly temple, in which Christ is the cornerstone, the prophets and the apostles are the foundation, an image which is then picked up in the early chapters of the book of Revelation, and that we, as living stones, are being built up in this great household, this great temple of God, as the walls and many throughout church history have referenced that the proverbial mortar, that which actually binds and holds those stones together, is the blood of the martyrs also. The pages of Christian history are drenched in blood. And it is drenched in the blood of those who have willingly and courageously and valiantly sacrificed their lives in service of our God and King who himself sacrificed his life. They testified not only to their faith, but rather, more importantly, they testified to the faith. They testified to the truth. They testified to the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. As God has loved us, so they loved him more than their own lives. As indeed Christ trusted his Father, particularly and especially through the Garden of Gethsemane, so too these martyrs trusted that the very same Father of our Lord and Saviour would bring them through death also. As Christ himself so courageously bore his cross, so they courageously went to their deaths, many of which were upon a cross. As I said earlier, those of the new covenant, those after the closing of the canon of Scripture, are so voluminous and so numerous in number and indeed are so equal in the worthiness of their actions that anyone would also be pressed for time as the author of Hebrews was here to even recount them all. Hence why he says here, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, those who Again, this imagery of the clouds, again, it's this adjoining of heaven and earth, that heaven itself bears witness that those who have triumphed through death by the grace of God in the spirit of Christ, 
now are alive with him. They are co-heirs with him, that indeed Christ calls them his subjects, his brothers, his friends. And that their testimony, the witness of their action in this world, their spiritual faithfulness, even unto death, surrounds us at any given time throughout history as Christians as a witness to what we are part of, as a witness to the power of God in their lives, as a witness to the power of God that indeed changes not only our lives, but changes the world. And it's upon that basis, by laying aside every weight and the sin which so easily entangles us, that the author then calls us to run with endurance the race that is set before us. A common motif through the New Testament, there are two particular ones, one of the warrior and the other of the athlete. Of course, in this day of the Greco-Roman world, the uh, the famous culture, athletic culture of the Greeks and the Romans was uh, ubiquitous in the, in the world at these day, in these days. The great glories of the Olympic Games and the Delphic Games and the various uh, Olympiads and the various festivals of the Greeks throughout history, which have been around for centuries and centuries by this time, a great and ancient custom of theirs, or the various athletic endeavours and events which even have endured to our time. This is their culture. The athlete was one who was disciplined. The athlete was one who was courageous. The athlete that was one who strove to achieve great heights, to break records, to accomplish things which had never been accomplished before. All for the honour of his name, for the honour of his family, for the honour of his homeland, his city-state or his island, etc., etc., here, the author of the he to the Hebrews, as well as others throughout the New Testament, pick up on this very, very common image of the ancient Greco-Roman world and apply it to Christians. Let us run with endurance, perseverance, steadfastness, the race that is set before us. Let us strive in the fulfilment of our destiny with endurance, as Christ himself fulfilled his destiny with the utmost and ultimate endurance. Christ himself not only modelled but indeed exemplified many of these great athletic virtues of discipline, of courage, of honour, of endurance, of triumph. And so here we are being called to this very action. It's why, again, like the term martyr, another famous phrase which became very uh, embedded in the life of the early church from those earliest days was a term that is known historically as athleta Christi, an athlete of Christ or a champion of Christ, borrowing from that Olympic context, that athletic context of the Greeks, that we as athletes of Christ, those who run the race that is set before us, directly drawing from this very text, that we also triumph through that and we obtain a crown of glory not for ourselves but ones that will be laid down at the feet of Christ himself who bears the ultimate cosmic crown. In running this race in verse 2 we are to fix our eyes on Jesus. We are to have him at the end of our gaze just as the athlete runs the stadia, which was the, the shortest of the sprints in the ancient world, where we get the English word stadium from. It was about 180 metres right, to the length of the stadium. As the athlete would gaze toward the finish line of his race, we are to gaze toward the finish line of our race, and that finish line is the Christ who waits for us. It is Jesus, our Saviour, who awaits our arrival. He is the end goal. He is the one whom we fix our eyes upon. He is the finish line of our faith and he is the very trophy that we seek to win. And indeed, by the grace of God, we do and we shall. This is, of course, the hope and the promise that's inherent to this kind of text as well as many others that are related to it both in the Old and New Testaments. 
This Jesus is pointed to here by a very poetic and poignant phrase, the author and perfector of our faith. The author and perfector. The one who creates it. The one who orchestrates it. The one who brings it into being. The fountain, the wellspring, the source, the origin, the genesis of our faith. The author. The one who has inscribed it upon the very tablets of history. And the perfector. Perfection meaning completion the totality thereof. If a student gets a perfect score in a test, it's because they have successfully completed the the test in its totality with regards to correct answers. It's a perfect score. It's complete and total. Christ here is the perfector of our faith. He himself has literally and figuratively embodied it. He has literally and figuratively accomplished it. And the very faith that we have is but a gift from God through the Holy Spirit, as the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2. He is the author and perfector of our faith. And the faith that we are called to run this race with, we know, thanks be to God, is not from ourselves. It's not something that we must continually muster of our own feeble and mortal power. But instead, we can turn and cast our eyes, fix them indeed, upon Christ, who is the source of our faith, the origin and the end, the author and perfector of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. With the joy that was set before him now, Christ is also, again as I was hinting at earlier, being modelled as an athlete. That he himself, for the joy that was set before him, for the great triumph and glory at the end of his race, he ran and he indeed endured the cross. As we are called to run our race with endurance, We do so upon the foundation and the bedrock of Christ having himself with this great virtue of endurance marched before the cross, endured it, and through it triumphed over it. The cross itself, not only the physical event, but also the more abstract metaphysical reality of Christ who is life triumphing over death itself, which is, of course, the very heart of what the cross represents. The cross is death, but it's through that death that the cross has now become our life. And he did so with joy, even through great anguish, as I referenced earlier in regards to the event in the Garden of Gethsemane, this time of unfathomable fear, this time of great quaking, spiritually and emotionally and psychologically. He nevertheless did not abandon his mission. He did not abandon his destiny. He did not abandon us. For Christ to have failed in the Garden of Gethsemane would be for him to have lost all of us, his people. There would be no salvation for any of his people in his time, past, present, or future. We follow, we serve, we honour, we worship, we venerate, we glorify one who endured, like the greatest of ancient athletes, the event that was before him. And through his death, life has triumphed. Hence, why he finishes here in the end of verse 2 with stating that he has now sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Of course, a very, very common reference throughout both the Old and New Testaments. He achieved the crowning glory. He has been crowned. Indeed, in the book of Revelation, he is described as bearing a laurel wreath, that which would be given to the great athletic champions of the Olympics and other such festivals and events throughout the Greco-Roman world. 
He now bears a crown of victory. Indeed, the very name Stephen, Stephanos, means and references that notion of a crown, one who is crowned. The martyr Stephen was crowned with glory, not of his own accord, but the glory of Christ that he was crowned with through his faithfulness even unto death as the first martyr of the new covenant. This author to the Hebrews is pointing to us all, pointing out to us all this great inspiration that has been traversing through the end of chapter 11 and now has reached its great climax. This cloud of witnesses, these hall of heroes that we are able to look back upon at the very throne of that hall, of course, is Christ himself who is most firmly and most rightly in view. That all those other who are witnesses, who are martyrs, all those who are part of that hall of heroes, we too can look to, just as the Apostle Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Why is this so pertinent? Why is this so important for us to remember how this has occurred. Well, it's because of that very portion of 1 Corinthians 15, which I'd now like to briefly reference for us, that we had read earlier. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 53 to 58, we read the following. For this corruptible, referring to the mortal body, must put on incorruptible, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this corruptible puts on the incorruptible and this mortal puts on immortality, then will come about the word that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Of course, famous quotation from the Old Testament. The triumph of life over death. What's in view here is not just merely the singular event of the resurrection of Christ, of course we focus and celebrate that rightfully upon Easter. But even more broadly and consequently, the metaphysical reality of life itself having now triumphed over death in, through and by the hand of Christ. This is what is in view. The great transcendent reality that death is not the end of the human story. That the seed of death that was indeed planted in primordial times in that Garden of Eden through the rebellion and fall of mankind. That same seed which has so marred and defected us, which has so permeated the human condition across the aeons, is not going to rule the day for indeed now it does not we have indeed received the spiritual resurrection being raised to life through the new birth through the, that which we refer to as being born again the new life that we possess spiritually in Christ we have been crowned with and now we await the completion of that which is the consummation of our bodily resurrection that as Christ himself has been raised from the dead, as the first fruits, that we too, as the body of Christ, will also be raised from the dead, not unto condemnation as others will, but indeed for us, unto eternal life. To live and reign with Christ, our King and our Saviour, forever. That primordial state of paradise restored fully and finally and once and for all. Death having been swallowed up, consumed in victory. Now the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not only his victory, but it is indeed now, as a most gracious and undeserved gift, been granted unto us. We are now crowned also with that victory. We become partakers. We become sharers in that great victory. 
And this is exactly why the author of the Hebrews highlights that great cloud of witnesses with Christ himself at the very heart and epicenter of that cloud upon the throne. Indeed, all of them demonstrate through their victory over circumstance or victory through circumstance, the great triumph of life over death in Christ. They themselves are the exemplars that God himself has provided that demonstrate this great and blessed reality that death is swallowed up in victory. That they themselves were indeed given the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ and we also have as well. Then here the Apostle Paul finishes with what is a rather remarkable and incredible exhortation in verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast. In other words, endure, as the author of Hebrews would say. Be immovable. Be unshakable. Be firmly planted like a great and ancient oak always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labour is not in vain. Be steadfast, be immovable, knowing that your labour, your work for God, your work in this world, is not in vain. Of course, the Apostle Paul himself also describes how without the resurrection, everything we do would be in vain. If there is no resurrection unto life, then every action of man, including his religion, is but a trite and pathetic abandonment of all hope. It is indeed a hopeless reality. Yet, here he says that because of, what, of the basis of death having been swallowed up in victory, because indeed we have now been crowned with that victory by the gracious gift of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our head, that we now are called to be steadfast and immovable because our labour is not in vain. This is why the celebration of what was historically referred to as All Saints Day, was so important to Christians. It's why, even in its earliest forms that go back to the second century, the honouring, rightful in its early contexts, of those who have died in the faith, of not only those who have achieved great things, but even those who, through ordinary, humble lives, have demonstrated the very same faith in Christ. All together... Various parallel but equal categories. Why this has been such a central focus throughout the history of Christianity. It is because indeed, in spite of these circumstances, our labour is not in vain. That as we look back upon those like whom the author to the Hebrews refers to, who we read of now in the scriptures, Their labour was not in vain. Their work, their life in this world was not trivial. It was not inconsequential. Whether it were great achievements or comparatively small achievements, those mentioned in that very brief list as well as the exorbitant amount of everyone else whose names are not known to the scriptures or to history, of course, which is the vast majority of us, All of them are ultimately in view in regards to this great cloud of witnesses. Throughout the medieval period, there were unhelpful and indeed unbiblical accretions and novelties. But through the Reformation, what is quite surprising to learn is that the reformers, almost entirely across the board in fact, sought with great care to reform this particular Christian holiday, this this festival for the basis of not wanting to throw a baby out with bathwater, but rather to recognise that here the author to the Hebrews is actually explaining the very foundation and basis of what that holiday was. A remembrance of those who have, through endurance and great courage, 
been put to death for their Christian faith, as many even in our own time now are also, every single year. It was in honour of those who actually triumphed over death, who were great and honourable and faithful kings, warriors, defenders of their people, as well as all of those among us who have been honourable and faithful Christians throughout their lives, honouring the humble mother and father who do their duty in raising their children, imparting to them the Christian faith, its morals, its virtues, its values, who conduct themselves honourably in the humble work of everyday life. All of that was what was brought back into view, which was very much that view in the early church through the Reformation. And it is because this very text that we have before us is exactly what is being referenced. It is indeed those who have triumphed over and those who have triumphed through circumstance who stand now as a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, who through their witness, literally, martyrion, their martyrdom, and through their general witness of their life, encourage us, inspire us to march forward, to run our race with endurance. Like we touched on last week, we are so blessed in the Christian religion with an incredibly unique heritage, a tradition like no other that we can and not only can, but indeed should learn of those who have come before us, who have run their race with endurance, the same race which we now run. Of course, it's been a year now that we've been undertaking our course on church history. And so many of you have found incredible value in that, those who watch in person or those who watch online. Seeing these examples from the early church, which we've now completed and covered that period, who laid and built up upon that foundation of Christ and the apostles, who themselves were many of these various martyrs, which again, like the author of the Hebrews says, time would fail me to even account for one of those categories, let alone all of them. Instead of allowing a Christian celebration holiday, an ancient one in fact, which we refer to as Halloween, to be taken over by trite commercialism, by immorality, by hedonism and heathenism, might we instead recapture it and bring it back to its origins, bring it back to its foundations, bring it back to the very basis that this passage actually explains. That it is a celebration, ultimately, of life triumphing over death, that Christ has gained the victory, that he has conquered death, that he now is the very apex and summit of the example of the one who has, as the author of the Hebrews says in chapter 11, verse 33, through faith conquered kingdoms, performed righteousness, obtained promises, etc., etc., all of this being the great description of Christ himself, ultimately. This day always was about a celebration of life over death and that we now have been crowned with that life as a gift from Christ our King. And we would do well to return to it. For indeed, we all serve and honour and venerate and worship the God who has triumphed over death, the one who has swallowed it up in victory. Amen.